Faith in the Frontier by Dryden Brown. On the wall in my childhood bedroom, there's an old watercolor of American militiamen marching to battle. Some insights. My dad told me stories about our revolutionary era ancestors, James and John Piper. James settled to America from Kilgmore, Ireland in the early 18th century. Northern Ireland faced religious conflicts and a broken economy. James wanted to freely practice his faith, own land, and build a better life for his family. James had faith in the frontier. He took a risk, boarded a ship, and set out to help build a fledgling society that aligned with his values and vision for the future. James' son, John, fought for the Pennsylvania militia in the Revolutionary War. His dad took a risk sailing across the Atlantic to build a freer life, and he wasn't going to relinquish his birthright without a fight. After winning the war, John served as a political figure involved in the founding of Pennsylvania's government. As a kid, I woke up looking at the watercolor in my bedroom, seemingly in the direct view of men like the Pipers. I was inspired by their vision and willingness to take a heroic stand to build a society according to their values. On Sundays, my dad and I would go to the Blockbuster. Uh, we'd often rent Star Trek or Star Wars, parking on Milpa streets, getting out of our 96 Volvo 850. My dad told me that soon cars would fly. Blockbuster and my dad are both gone, and cars still roll around in much of the same way that they did when I was hunting around the video store for Wrath of Khan. People in technology often complain about the technological stagnation, but worse, we don't even have clear visions for the future. The Valley is totally failing in this regard. Even AOC has nice posters. All value systems imply a desired future. Do we have a coherent value system? Liberals want a more equal future, and many vegans want to live in a world that values animal lives at par with humans, or at least treats them less cruelly. I want to live in a human maximalist future. Technology can help us build the future our values demand. We do not build technology for technology's sake. All of our efforts cash out in consciousness. Technology will help us live longer lives. Technology will help us live more purposeful lives. Technology will let humanity journey into eternity and the stars. We've lost the future because we've lost the past. We live in an atomized society. We bowl alone and demonize our compatriots together. John Piper grew up in a society founded on common notions of good and evil. He cultivated his heroic spirit. When James Piper's home of Kilgmore faced religious persecution, a desperate economic situation, and a society that had strayed far from his values, he left to build a new society on the frontier. To build the future, we need to converge on a vision for it. To converge on a vision for the future, we need to converge on values. To build a future, we need to build a new society. And to build a new society, we need faith in the frontier. Join Praxis. Wow. So <laughs> that was uh, a blog, uh, the very first blog that was published uh, from Praxis Society, which is a, a project that has raised venture capital funding in order to start its own network state. They haven't said exactly where they're going to try to buy land, but uh, the point is to have the money so they can buy land on, well, I mean, they say very uh, clearly on their website, on the coast, so you can expect nice weather, um, and probably in the Mediterranean. Um, and so I just wanted to recite this, uh, to, to <laughs> read this blog, even though it hurt me to do so, um, to show kind of like that there is actual money backing this concept of the network state, and there are people out there uh, with a lot of money and therefore a lot of power to try and push uh, this narrative and to uh, to will it into uh, reality. Um, but so uh, going on off of this, um, I want to introduce our, our guests and my co-hosts. I have the High Priestess Primavera with me, and I have uh, Morshed Madden, who I think would be characterized as a paladin in Blockchain Gov. <laughs> Morshed, if I could give you one, uh, a role. And we're going to be talking to Raymond Crabe. He's a historian of modern Latin America with research and teaching interests in the intersections of space, politics, and everyday practice at Cornell University. And he recently published a book called Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. So hi, Raymond. How are you doing? And what did you think about this uh, blog piece? <laughs> well, um, th thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the blog piece you read is... Uh, fairly boilerplate in some ways, I guess. I mean, the vision of history, the vision of the frontier, it's very anodyne. It's very, you know, he uses the term himself heroic. Um, it reminded me a lot of the the sort of way in which history is mobilized in, in the book on seasteading by Joe Quirk, 
who's the current director of the Seasteading Institute, right, which was founded in 2008 with a uh, startup money from um, Peter Thiel. And Quirk co-authored that book with um, Patrick Friedman, the grandson of Milton Friedman, right, sort of uh, grandfather of neoliberalism, I guess, in some ways. I don't know. Maybe that's not entirely fair to others. But um, so, you know, but the, the same sort of vision of history in the frontier, which is very, you know, emancipatory, uh, very positive, uh, totally neglects or negates the sort of violence and also assumes the idea of the frontier from a particular perspective. It wasn't a frontier from many people's eyes. And so, um, but no again, I, of any of yeah. the natives <laughs> exactly. at all. And exactly yeah, at all. the fact that he called it a birthright was, uh, yeah. It was pretty appalling, pretty appalling to me. Yeah. And so this is, you know, this is a huge problem, which is this kind of historical, and this is something that's plagued, you know, some of the people I write about, uh, you know, these the people I describe as libertarians that are, you know, not anarchists. I mean, there are people that are, you might call anarcho-capitalists, if you, if you like that term, but um, who really sort of, you know, hyper-capitalists, very devoted to property rights, uh, private property rights. And so they, you know, they do have this kind of, you um, difficulty in dealing with the, you know, square peg of violent accumulation of land through dispossession of uh, peasants in England, kicking the commoners off the land all the way to uh, expropriating lands from native peoples and so on and so forth, and how to square that with their dedication to private property rights and the sanctity of property. And so they have no choice, I guess, in some ways, but to kind of ignore these forms of expropriation or to try to explain them away as, um, you know, a birthright uh, or empty space that's not being used and, and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it was a pretty, um, uh, not a surprising uh, paragraph to hear you read. Uh, just, just to add a little bit to the, to the saga, I think it's also interesting to, to talk about how much money they got, because it's actually, in terms of narrative, it might sound like, oh my God, what's happening? Uh, they actually raised $50 million, which is relatively little for the ambitions that they have of like purchasing out land. And, and also, interestingly, um, part of those fundings actually come, uh, well, first from Peter Thiel, but also from Alameda Research. <laughs> uh, so, wow. so we don't really know if they really got that money. But, um, but it's interesting because every, like, it's kind of like it's getting a little bit of visibility and people are talking about praxis as, it's like, um, as if it's actually like some kind of serious project because they got funding. But it's like $50 million is like hardly any country there's no negotiation power <laughs> with 50 million dollars so it's like it's also like there's this this very powerful narrative and then in practice there is actually not so many uh so significant means <laughs> it reminds me of uh austin powers right when uh dr evil comes back uh 30 years later and holds the country the world hostage and he says you know, I'm going to blow up the world unless you give me one million dollars, and everybody's howling with laughter at him because, right, the Starbucks investments are much more than that. It's a great scene. Yeah. <laughs> Sneak in Austin Powers into the conversation. Um, so, I think for uh, assuming that practice society, maybe at some points they do get a lot of money. Say they they do their one their their little venture with their fifty million. I think what their their first step in this whole thing, I think, is like set up a temporary, like they'll have a big, you know, conference where everybody who's a, a citizen, so to say, of of their network state would could come and visit and um they'll just talk about network states, I guess. Um uh so like eventually, you know, they're going to buy land and let's say they become successful, they'll buy more land, they'll expand. Uh, and they'll become uh, a network uh, state. And, and to, to be fair, I think like from like uh, from reading various things, I think they they don't. Uh, I think they speak of network state, but I don't think of network state in the definition that Balaji has given. In the sense that they don't actually uh, claim to have the intention to um, create an independent state. Right? They don't want to uh, declare sovereignty. Not yet. And say, uh, <laughs> not yet. So we never say. know what happened left. Yeah. But, uh, but I think that's, that's also an important thing in the sense that uh, there, is, there is many ways in which we are talking about network state and they have very different understanding. Uh, and, but because there is only this terminology, everyone is just assuming always 
the best or the worst, depending on the on the position. But I think for praxis, it's, it's more like an experiment of uh, can we create like this special economic zone? Can we can we negotiate with a particular country to give us some privilege, uh, probably most likely related to taxation and um, and innovation. Uh, so it's also like, I'm just saying this in the sense that we also need to be mindful of, uh, there are some uh, initiatives, I'm not, I'm not saying that Praxis is one of them, but I think there is some initiatives that are much uh, less radical and, uh, and you know, maybe more viable than others. It, it reminds me a little bit of um, performance art almost, where they are sort of mimicking efforts of you know actual people who have tried to create states or even uh, copying the efforts of artists like NSK in the 80s who also you know used passports and other uh, emblems of the state as a way of trying to uh, show um, that they are you know revolting against uh, the you know, the decline of Yugoslav socialism, for instance, and um, how that was transforming state socialism. But so maybe to, to, to ground this conversation, I would like if you could, Raymond, for l- listeners who may not know much about it and who may not understand it, if you could go through maybe like quick definitions of what are, uh, of, of these concepts, like colonization or colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism and decolonization. Because I think those are like kind of three important concepts to to understand if you are someone who wants to critically look at the network state or to like, you know, a- attempt to think critically about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, I, um, you know, these are sort of different definitions, I guess, or sort of general definitions I would give um, from the perspective of, you know, someone working on, on the kinds of things that I've worked on in relationship to, you know, Spanish empire or colonialism in the United States or in the Americas more generally. Um, but yeah, I mean, colonialism, I think you can think about as, um, as you know, the exertion of political and economic control uh, over uh, another nation state or another territory that's not, you know, quote unquote, your own. Um, oftentimes people will distinguish between empire and colonialism and the the tendency is to see colonialism um vis-a-vis empire as uh involving settlers uh so settler colonialism you know you might think of that as a redundancy but not necessarily um so you have uh people who will write about latin america and call the countries of latin america neo-europe's um because they are uh, countries that essentially are founded eventually out of the basis of uh, European settlement in which the indigenous populations are constantly struggling for sort of, you know, recognition for rights uh, and so on and so forth. Then you also have economic exploitation and, and, and dispossession uh, as well as part of uh, as part of thinking about uh, colonialism. So it's not only about political authority and, and political control and settlement and establishment, but also about economic extraction. Um, the classic example that, that sometimes people talk about is the colonial compact in which you know, the mother country, Spain, in this example, uh, extracted resources out of the countries that, that became you know, known as Latin America. So Mexico and Peru in particular extracted silver, shipped it back to the metropole to Madrid, uh, and um, and the idea was is that the colonies existed in part to sort of enrich the the motherland. So it's a kind of extractivist uh, uh, relationship. Neocolonialism oftentimes refers to um, forms of colonialism that persist even after the formal end of of um, of colonial control. So after the end of of politi- formal political control. So let's say, you know, France leaving uh, parts of Southeast Asia or uh, Germany and uh, England and others leaving parts of Africa or Spain leaving uh, or being kicked out of uh, parts of much of Latin America, that there's ongoing forms of colonialism that exist in the inequality of power around economic relationships. So especially the ability to use economic weapons uh, to uh, control uh, the political and economic uh, lives of places 
is oftentimes what people use the term neocolonialism to mean. So a very good example is someone like Franz Fanon, the great um, Martinican intellectual who spent a long time in Algeria and wrote The Wretched of the Earth. One of the things he talks about is the ability of uh, international corporations backed by their home governments to use the threat of capital flight to influence dramatically the nature of political elections in countries that have overthrown colonial rule, right? So in the midst of the 1950s and the 1960s and the struggles in places like Algeria and elsewhere, you know, he was critiquing the ability. It wasn't just a political question. It was also the, the, the question of economic power being used to sustain uh, colonial relationships, even if the political authority had, had removed itself, right? And this is an ongoing thing that we see around us all the time, you know, to this day. I mean, it, it's uh, the, the legacies and echoes of colonialism are, you know, on, ongoing. And, and a lot of the political struggles you see in places today um, are, are related to that. Decolonization, just very quickly, you know, form, I mean, in some ways, the very narrow sense of decolonization is the end of the end of colonial rule. Um, and, you know, the first wave of decolonization was really the 18 teens and 1820s in which um, uh, many of the places that were colonized in what is now Latin America overthrew, uh, right, ended Spanish rule and transitioned into different forms of kind of nation state forms. And then the second wave of decolonization, of course, was the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s after, especially after World War II, with the end of these formal empires like uh, Britain, France, and uh, and so forth. Um, but the one thing I will throw in the mix here that I think is important in the conversation is, is that, it, you know, the, the idea that you transition from colonial rule to a nation, independent nation state, uh, is not a natural uh, process. There was enormous contestation around this, um, uh, including in West Africa, in which uh, leaders of independence movements there were looking for the possibilities of setting up confederations rather than nation states. They were looking at the possibility of setting up kinds of autonomous relationships vis-a-vis -vis metropolitan powers. Um, if you look at the contemporary Pacific uh, and things like French Polynesia, um, right, there's a lot of questions around uh, uh, what it would look like for places to be totally independent as nation states and lose certain kinds of subsidies that they get from the metropole um, and so there's all, there's a lot of, there's a range of political possibilities that could have come out of decolonization in the 1940s and the 1950s, but a lot of it was channeled into a kind of nation state, uh, paradigm, which wasn't necessarily acceptable or, or desirable by, uh, by a lot of people. Um, and I write about one of those instances actually in my, in my book, when I talk about the New Hebrides and Vanuatu, because that's one of the complicating factors of that, uh, that relationship. So those are, you know, hopefully that kind of um, gives a sense of thinking about colonialism, yeah. neocolonialism, decolonization. Yeah. So for me, when I think of colonialism, I think of basically what this blog piece that I read, like, is kind of referring to kind of, and also, so like, that's a type of colonization that you don't see very much anymore today, like, though, you don't really like, have a direct link between governments uh, taking over, like another uh, sort of territory anymore that was that is like the history of the americas and that is like basically how it came to be and how uh basically what led to the genocide of uh native americans um and then so then there was this evolution towards neocolonialism where uh it became more rather than a direct link with other nation states or governments it became a link with like the power of capital or these large corporations that were able to who were mostly run by people from the former colonies um uh, to, to, to sort of still keep the ability to extract uh, resources, but via free markets, like just using the excuse of markets as being like this kind of voluntary, like field anybody can play in, in which case they just so happen to be the one to be right there to, uh, to win in that, that market game um, so that they can continue uh, yeah, accumulating wealth and accumulating resources, uh, having the huge advantage of like better machinery, having like uh, all these type of things that that the formerly colonized need. They sort of need like someone to uh, economically develop them because when they were colonized, they were not given the ability to develop themselves. And so it created this dependence over time. 
Um, and then decolonization, the history of it is really just like uh, a half-assed measure for uh, most of these uh, now countries and nation states. Uh, sort of that, that entire process didn't really give them, didn't give them the ability to be autonomous in the first place. Um, and so I think in the context of like network states and this fantasy of libertarian exit, um, I really, uh, like now it seems that it, it, to me, it's like a, a neo-colonialism that may not necessarily be linked to like you specifically being from the former direct colonizer of some place in which you may have bought some land, but that you are anyway sort of like someone who has benefited perhaps by having grown up in the West or grown up in countries that did do colonization uh, to be able to massively influence uh, a, a particular, um, like whatever the, the place in that you're buying, buying land in, like in the case of what Praxis is trying to do. You know, I, I do think, you know, neocolonialism, but also even the language of colonialism can be appropriate right. here. There's also um, a weird nostalgia I mean, with normal colonialism, with the people who are <laughs> trying to do neocolonialism uh, a lot of the times. I mean, it's amazing to me, right, that the language of colonization is, you know, straight up, right? I mean, in the Seasteaders uh, materials, they sometimes talk about colonizing right, the ocean, yeah. colonizing the high seas. Uh, the language of colonizing outer space, uh, orbital space, Mars, uh, the moon. Um, and that, you know, I think you're right to point out the close connections to, um, uh, to private interests. I mean, in, in all of these, right, these are, uh, these are questions around, it's not about uh, formal uh, political states uh, necessarily doing these things. A lot of it is being pushed by private interests that are looking to ensure that they have access to seabed minerals and to uh, the kinds of things you might be able to extract from moon rock and, and uh, whether or not you can even um, set up orbital space manufacturing facilities, right, to basically uh, manufacture things and so forth. And, um, and so the language of colonization is, um, is rich and, and right there. I mean, it's quite, uh, it's quite remarkable. It's in your face. Um, at the same time, I think that uh, I don't want to play the devil's advocate, but uh, uh, I will try to do it anyways, um, in the sense that I think it's, it's interesting because, of course, all those things can apply, right? Like we can, we can think about neocolonialism, which is like how those um, powerful actors that actually continue to exercise uh, power have an impact territory that they don't necessarily own by creating those autonomous uh, economic zones and so forth. We can talk about like sheer colonialism by uh, actually going and colonizing territories, whether, whether territories that were not yet claimed with like, the seasteading or territory that have already been claimed. Um, but but uh, playing the devil's advocate, I would say that actually within the narrative, there is also the narrative of decolonization uh, in the sense that it is also about uh, claiming autonomy and independence from a colonizer, which is the nation state, uh, which not everyone has necessarily um, opt in to this, right? And so, of course, because it is like tech billionaires, then it feels kind of strange to talk about decolonization. If it was, if it was a group of like, you know, local indigenous people that, that wants to claim sovereignty, then that would be actually decolonization. So how do we actually draw the line about like, is first of all, decolonization, is it always good or bad? Of course not. It depends on who is colonizing or decolonizing from whom. Um, but I think that in, in the narrative or in, in, those, in those initiatives, the narrative of decolonization is actually perhaps the strongest between between if we have to pick between colonization, neocolonialism, or, decolon or decolonialism, I will say that they actually uh, bring the claim that uh, the nation state has taken over all the space and that they want to create more sovereignty, more autonomy, more independence, uh, which is not that different from the countries that wants to decolonize. It. It's just that uh, the, the population that is trying to do that is very different. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful point because I do think, you know, one of the things that is clear is in the wake of World War II and, um, and some of the struggles I was talking around uh, about around decolonization and, and desires for something other than the nation state, but not wanting a colony either. Um, it's true, right? You end up with an empire of nation states. 
Uh, and so there is a kind of reworking of, of, of empire that takes place in the form of the nation state um, and to the right, oftentimes to the detriment of minoritized populations in these new states. I mean, no wonder South Sudan broke away from Sudan right 10 years ago. Uh, and you see this in other places as well. There's these uh, uh, offshoot movements that uh, of, of people who don't feel like they're any better represented by the new nation state than they were by uh, the colonial um, power. I think the the interesting thing about the the question of decolonization um, in things like the network states and some of these other projects is, uh, you know, the question of of um, capital. And so it's one thing to decolonize from the nation state, but I think the the trick always here, it seems to me, well, I don't want to say the trick, but I think the, the, you know, the interesting thing to me here in part is that when you looking at the parts of the nation state of the network state that I've read and then looking at uh, the Seasteaders um, uh, materials and, and the book that Joe Quirk wrote with Patrick Friedman is, you know, the object of critique, the fundamental object of critique is the state, is the nation state. Uh, but capital just kind of gets a pass. And that's, you know, it's interesting to me because capital and the state are sort of deeply entwined. And then capital itself, I mean, it, it, there's an argument to be made that um, in many instances, decolonization was also an effort to kind of extricate oneself from these webs of um, uh, of capitalist markets and uh, extractivism uh, and the like. Um, even early on, I mean, the, the expansion of uh, you know company states and things like this oftentimes could you know could go that went along with empire, but also sort of preceded empire. I mean, empire could follow in the wake of company states. Um, and so the role of I think the role of profit uh, and uh, the role of capital here is really important. And that's not something that um, the network state and other kinds of things are interested in decolonizing. Right? They're not. They're, these are things they're going to ratchet up. Uh, at some level. And to me, that's, you know, that's something for real uh, concern. A privatized state is, is, is still a state. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it, it's going to be structured along diff different kinds of hierarchies of power, but they're still going to be there. And this notion of opting in and opting out at will is just simply not feasible to huge numbers of people. And it's not only because it's not feasible because of political restrictions, it's not feasible because of economic restrictions. Um, and so there's a, that, that's for me is the, is, is one of the issues here that I think is important in the language of colonialism, decolonization and neocolonialism is, is the, uh, the rule of capital. And which uh, many of the, like, if you were like an indigenous group trying to fight for sovereignty, a lot of times you won't have capital, like you won't have the type of money that that you would need in order to exert autonomy, given the rules of the system is kind of how I have seen it. Yeah, I mean, I think of, um, you know, you can think of other kinds of, I, I mean, I try to differentiate these in my book. And so I, t I call them exile, rather than exit communities. And, you know, there I'm drawing a little bit from, from a, um, a book and writing by a sociologist Dennis O'Hearn and um, and a, a sociologist anthropologist and and um, an anarchist intellectual uh, Andre Grubacek, uh, they use the term exile to think about uh, communities like the Zapatistas, right? So so mostly indigenous uh, communities in the south of Mexico who felt that you know their aspirations that their possibilities for existence have been betrayed by the Mexican state over the course of the 20th century and that the, the, the promise of the Mexican revolution had been betrayed, especially with the signing of NAFTA in 1994 and the end of land reform. And, um, and so, you know, they, they exit in some ways, but, but not in the ways that there would be anything comparable to something like the network state or something like this. I mean, theirs is a critique of capital as much as it is a critique of the Mexican state. I mean, their concern is that the Mexican state is basically controlled by international finance uh, and Wall Street uh, and, and the like. And so things like austerity measures and, you know, the role of the World Trade Organization, uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and what it did to the country in the 1980s, and especially how it stripped away subsidies from the poor uh, 
forced uh, the government to open up its economy because of the debt crisis, that these things meant that essentially the Mexican state didn't respond right to the electorate to the electorate uh, and didn't represent uh, the vast majority of the Mexican populace. Um, so there you have a kind of exile community, right? They've tried to set up their own kinds of social relations, their own sort of productive operations, and, you know, dentists and medical care and, and education and so on and so forth. But they live in in tension, right, with the Mexican state. Yeah. Um, one question, perhaps, like, uh, it feels like, if I understand the, the, the various uh, definitions correctly, is that um, we basically have colonialism, which is essentially, like, political power that gets into, like, um, co-opting territories, um, which then leads to, even after they leave, because of the, because of the power and because of the economic uh, relationship that are created, leaves this form of neocolonialism, even when the political structure has actually um, decolonized. Um, it seems to me that like, when we think about the network cities, perhaps like, I don't know if even neocolonialism is correct, because it's not something that comes afterwards. It's almost as if like they are using the power and the, the power of capital, essentially, as a form of uh, new neocolonialism which then potentially could lead to a real form of colonialism. And in this sense, it's almost as if like the, the neocolonialism comes before, uh, like creating those <laughs> proto economic zones. It's, it's proto-colonialism, <laughs> exactly. And it's like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a completely new form. Like, I think it's almost strange to equalize it to neocolonialism when, in fact, there has been no uh, political structure to, to begin with. Uh, but because they have managed in one way or another to accumulate enough power and capital, then they can prepare the ground <laughs> for perhaps eventually being able to declare uh, autonomy and independence. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it as a kind of pre-colonial neo-colonialism or something like that. I mean, it's been fascinating. Um, yeah, and I, I, you know, in, in certain instances, you, it, it feels like, um, uh, you know, one of the things I tried to mention is... Uh, is a sort of transition from uh, the more intense aspects of neoliberalism that you know arose in the 1970s with something like shock therapy in, in Chile uh, under the dictatorship of Pinochet with you know with Milton Friedman and von Hayek's blessing and support um, that kind of neoliberalism that you know sort of uh, kind of steroidal um, that sort of lays the groundwork for the possibilities of um, of this even more uh, kind of hyper privatized um, and, and and libertarian uh, sensibility, and you know, it, it, I wonder about these things because it does seem like the the structures in place seem to work entirely against things like you know general sort of government services, municipal services, um, and so forth. And so there's this constant uh, contracting out increasingly right uh to private operators in various kinds of ways i mean mike davis writes about this really eloquently in city of courts about how this op how this came about in los angeles um and this guy evan mckenzie who wrote a book called privatopia back in the 90s and and um and so in some ways i think about this this kind of current libertarian moment as something you know using the some of the kind of transformations that have taken place with things like technology and cryptocurrencies and so forth, but by using a basic fundamental groundwork that's been laid by some of the more radical neoliberal projects of the 70s and 80s, Reagan, Thatcher, and a lot of the deregulation that went on and it was continued by the Clinton administration and others, at least in the US. Hi everyone, if you're enjoying this episode so far, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, and join the crypto leftist communities on Discord or Reddit, which you can find links to in the show notes. If you're enjoying the episode or find the content I make important, you can pitch into my efforts starting at $3 a month on patreon.com slash the blockchain socialist to help me out and join the newest patrons like Lara and Fernanda. Supporting really helps since making this stuff isn't free in terms of money or time. As a patron, you'll get a shout out on an episode like I just did and access to bonus content like Q&A episodes where you can submit and vote on questions you'd like me to answer and I'll give my thoughts in roughly 20 minutes. In the last bonus episode, I analyzed applying an anti-capture framework made for DAOs but applying it towards left-wing organizing and the specific challenges that they face. Of course, I'll still be making free content like this interview to help spread the message that blockchain doesn't need to be used to further entrench capitalist exploitation, like as described in the network states, 
if we put our efforts into it. So if that message resonates with you, I hope you'll consider helping out. I was curious about um, orienting this discussion, not just in terms of capital, but also in terms of civilization and the understanding of uh, these libertarian tech founders about civilization. So as we know from, you know, like recent um, Marxist legal scholarship, for instance, the idea of civilization and um, has also been uh, informed by conceptions of both on the one hand, trying to, you know, include the other into civilization, while at the same time having, you know, this sort of almost not fully hidden contempt uh, for the other. Um, at the same time, this, you know, mission of trying to civilize is part of introducing them to capitalist modernity. And I'm uh, curious about whether this, you know, particular proto-colonial, neo-colonial, whichever term you use, uh, effort is an instantiation of this um, by, let's say, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit means. So what I mean is, is that the idea of um, how they see this as a sort of civilizing mission um, might also explain why they would want to create uh, these sorts of network states, but also might reflect their idea of how they see the world a bit. Because I think one of the points that really jumped out at me while reading Balaji's book was his claim that the creation of network states allows for the return of terra incognita, the return of terra nullius, um, both of which are highly controversial and criticized concepts. Um, and not something that is desirable. Again, you're sort of um, not only ignoring the existence of certain states, but in some cases treating humans as part of the landscape. Uh, again, this sort of reflects a sort of idea of what uh, civilization is and your position in civilization. So I was wondering whether that was something that um, you had also felt that this is not just about um, deregulation or capital, but also there's a sort of civilizational component to this um, discussion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you. I, I um, you know, there's a book I've been meaning to read. Maybe this is the book you're referring to called uh, Civilization as Capitalism or Capitalism as Civilization. Um, yes, exactly. I yeah, can't yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been meaning, yeah, I've been wanting to get to that, and I haven't had a chance. But, um, but yeah, I so, you know, the, what what your question brought to mind in part was, I mean, definitely the sort of, um, you know, e effort to think that there 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 can be a new terra nullius, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and some of that, of course, is is the language that they're using to talk about outer space and orbital space and and the oceans, uh, and of course, the ocean stuff is really difficult because I think the international law is much more complicated around, you know, the high seas than I think sometimes the seasteaders have let on. But I also, you know, it makes me think also about something that both is raised in the network state um, and is raised amongst some of the figures that I write about. And that is that their projects are what they call moral projects, moral experiments. And here, I do think they're, they are, in some form or another, um, uh, linking into this idea of a, of a kind of civilizing project in some sense, right? The moral project as a kind of uh, community of values uh, is the way I think it's kind of put in the network state, right? You have to have a community that has a sort of shared moral sensibility um, first and foremost, that you have to work from, right? The for-profit colonies were not successful, but the sort of religious communities were, right? Is the way he he puts it in in his his kind of um, bare bones kind of historical reconstruction. Um, or the person I look at, Michael Oliver, you know, talks about, you know, it's not about tax haven re. It's it, creating a new country is not about escaping paying taxes or tax havenry or something like this. It's not about making money per se, even though that's important, but it's about this kind of idea that at 
at its most basic freedom is the ability to opt in or to opt out of of a political uh, community or of a social uh, space. And so, you know, for him, this is the the way in which he um, puts it. And it does have this kind of um, civilizational ethos, uh, I think, in in some form, because I do think it at its uh, uh, sitting underneath that is this assumption that there is going to be or needs to be um, a kind of terra nullius on which to do this. I mean, it is ultimately, in the end, there is a blank slate argument or a blank slate supposition that sits behind uh, a lot of these things, even if they don't. I mean, in some instances, you can see the term blank slate actually right there, right? It, it, it comes up in a lot of this writing. But even when it doesn't, there is sitting behind it uh, an assumption in some ways that you can get beyond history, uh, that you can actually find these kinds of uh, spaces of terra nullius, that you can start all over anew. Um, and this is, you know, this is fantasy um, uh, in many respects, both the terra nullius part of it, unless it's forcibly created, uh, which, which kind of defeats the idea of terra nullius, or um, if, you know, the idea that you can simply start afresh from history. I mean, the, I mean, I think the Khmer Rouge is probably a very good example of how that's not going to work well, right? Um, so, yeah. I would like to jump in on this question of uh, uh, civilization and, and actually try to look, maybe like without necessarily connecting it to the discourses around the network state, but, uh, but um, I think that there is... Um, I actually I use it a lot myself uh, for good or bad reasons, but uh, I think like sometimes there is people that are from the internet, <laughs> uh, you know, that are that are that actually have been socializing themselves on the internet that uh, that are really like there is a, the, a culture that is uh, uh, internet uh, netizen whatever you want to call it. So I think there is something uh, interesting as well in the in exploring the extent to which. The fact that we have this uh, global system of communication has enabled people to coalesce around spe specific values, principles, around societal values as well, right? Um, and of course, it's not because, and, and you know, you can call them communities, you can call them tribes, or you can call them digital digital nations or however you want to you want you, you choose the name but this is all referring to this idea i think that there exist um new ways of connecting people and the culture that usually spread geographically because of proximity now can also spread in a transnational uh, manner by just going all over the internet. Um, and therefore, there is this concept of community of kinship um, or like nations that are not geographically bound into a particular state or territory. And I think there is value in also analyzing this. And of course, the question is, 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 is there a necessity that any single one of those digital nations have their own territory or can they live just like they have been living until now in the digital space and uh, and they can create their own you know metaverse and whatnot um, but but I think so I think the question of civilization becomes also relevant in in terms of what are we what are we talking about when we're talking about those digital nations are we talking can we accumulate um, can we assimilate them as some kind of uh, civilization and uh, and can they exist independently of having uh, a territory because they they are born on the digital and so they live on the digital and all of a sudden this and then going back to the network state it feels that uh, independently like because there is those digital nation if they are digital nation to begin with uh, therefore we also need the the nation state and therefore we also need a state and the state so far is geographically bound um, but you know and, and like if you think about like the early bit nation and stuff like that they were actually even talking about let's create a state for a digital nation but the state is a, is a digital state as well so there is also like all those granularities that exist which is the network state it, this the way in which Balaji has described it is this particular system in which a digital nation wants to instantiate itself into a physical state but can we have other modalities and and does it make sense for instance to have a digital nation instantiating itself into a digital state or 
just living without necessarily having even to coordinate itself through a state, but nonetheless developing new collective action mechanism and governance structure that uh, that that en- enable those people to 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 coordinate themselves at a the global scale. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting the collective action thing. I mean, I thought that was one of the things that was interesting in his book. Um, is uh, right is is his critique of micronations, um, and I guess in some ways, you know, the the stuff I write about about Michael Oliver probably fits in the the micronation or what he says should be called microstate, uh, which I probably would agree with. Um, microstate probably is a more accurate description. Um, you know, Michael Oliver, the person I write a lot about, I mean, was really a, a fits into that kind of microstate or micronation model. Uh, but I thought it was interesting his point that um, that the problem with the, the microstate model is it doesn't empower a kind of um, possibility of collective action, um, and you know in part because it, it's it is so driven uh, through the possibility of buying into this kind of contractual you know transactional community that's based. Uh, mostly around the, the the premise, right, that you can you can do what you want, and that it's all about uh, the privatization of services and signing a contract, and you know, exiting from the traditional nation state, uh, and and so forth. And so, I thought the whole kind of idea about collective action was was interesting in his um, uh, in his discussion because it does, right, it does sort of start to draw back in a recognition. Right of of uh, of how communities form, how they're going to sort of exercise a certain kind of uh, uh, power and and uh, and so forth. I think the you know the civilization question, but also the kind of digital state question. I mean, sooner or later, I mean, it, all the thing that um, I guess for me, I always come back to is that it, you know, there's all kinds of. Um, "Quote unquote cloud communities, right? That aren't necessarily cloud in the kind of sense that it's now come to be used. Um, and there's a multitude of these kinds of things that exist and have existed for a long time. But the issue always comes when you need territory and sovereignty. Um, and I just think that you can go so far down the line of kinds of the steps that he lays out. But sooner or later, once you kind of hit the ground of you know territory and sovereignty." Um, that's where I think that's where it, it it always becomes difficult. It becomes colonial in a sort of real immediate sense. Um, maybe there's some future in which a digital, a cloud community achieves a kind of sovereignty. I just don't even know what that looks like um, to me. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I mentioned in, in my book is that uh, I read a lot of sci-fi in kind of thinking through a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, it was really helpful. Neil Stephenson's Snow Crasher, uh, Snow Crash and uh, Neuromancer by Gibson and some of Kim Stanley Robinson's stuff. Um, uh, N.K. Jameson's uh, and, and uh, Octavia Butler. Um, but the, the sci-fi writer who I felt like really nailed it and, and I think nailed it because he's so attentive to the sort of mundane um, violence and, and structural reality around us is J.G. Ballard. Uh, he wrote this book, Supercon, another one called Cocaine Nights, um, Millennium People, you know, and he was this British writer, a sci-fi writer who, who grew up in a concentration camp in Shanghai under Japanese colonial rule. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and these are books in which he really focuses on these sort of super, super, super ultra high end business park residences that people live in on the coast of France, for example, in Supercon. And they just have everything there for them. And it's so high end and they're so removed from the reality of community and society that they get bored. And so you know, they're both boring and they're bored. And so they import crime. They pay to import crime for kind of erogenous stimulation, or they leave their compound and go out and just exercise their agency over the local people by just, you know, beating people up and savaging them and so forth. And they're totally untouchable, you know, and he has this wonderful uh, way of showing that, um, you know, the rest of us kind of of pay for elite agency, Um, you know, that, that, 
no matter how far fetched it might sound, right? But that at some level, that's exactly what's uh, what's happening. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a digression, but uh, that's where my head went. Since you've talked about Michael Oliver quite a bit, could you actually share a bit about who Michael Oliver was and how he compares with you know libertarian tech founders and you know people like Balaji? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, I write uh, the book. I, I guess you know it's in two parts, but the first part, which is about um, not just Michael Oliver, but but the projects that he was involved in and the people around him, uh, is really about two thirds of the book, and I spend a lot of time writing about. The projects he was involved in, um, you know, he was originally from Lithuania, uh, Jewish. All of his family were killed um, during the Holocaust, and then he came to the U.S. as a young man uh, in the late '40s after the war, um, and settled in Nevada. And over the course of the 1960s, I mean, he was involved in, you know, he was very influenced as many of the people in the '60s and '70s were, and still today. Uh, many people also that you would associate with libertarianism in the United States were deeply influenced by, you know, not just um, Ludwig von Hayek or uh, Ludwig von Mises, uh, but but also by or Murray Rothbard for that matter, but also by Ayn Rand, and um, and so a lot of them were reading and 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 sort of you know absorbing and uh, and repeating lines from Atlas Shrugged, which is probably her most famous. Um, book. And so he was very influenced by that. And in the 1960s, he, he just felt, you know, looking around uh, him that, um, that the U S was sort of in the midst of a, of a kind of free fall uh, and that totalitarianism, which is what he was most concerned about uh, because of his own experience uh, was, was sort of at the doorstep and, and that one needed to be able to set up a kind of escape hatch uh, and to exit um, and there was a lot of this kind of stuff in the 1960s. I mean, it's, it's a little bit comparable in some ways to our own moment. And one of the things that I try to point out is this kind of, there is a little bit of a kind of similarity between our own moment and the 1960s. I mean, the 1960s were an era of, you know, let's explore outer space, right? And the space race. Um, it's a moment in which people are writing a lot of books about, you know, we're on the cusp of ecological and demographic collapse. The climate catastrophe is just around the corner. Because of the tragedy of the commons, you know, Garrett Hardin's famous 1968 essay, which totally misunderstood the commons, but ha resonated at the time about uh, about the need to you know uh, uh, regulate common held resources, uh, but mostly through private right, privatization, um, or the population bomb by Paul and Anne Ehrlich, which imagined all kinds of you know apocalyptic scenarios just over the horizon because of demographic. Uh, growth and, and radical urbanization, um, and you have a lot of sci-fi being written in the 1960s that's exploring a lot of these questions as well. And then you also have this kind of monetary moment. Right? So now we have crypto and digital currencies, and in the 1960s, it was an effort to basically right, get people to invest in metals, gold and silver, and there were lots of debates around whether or not um, right gold should continue to be pegged at a certain fixed price, which had happened under Roosevelt, and whether or not the dollar should be pegged to gold, um, what was going to happen with um, you know all of uh, currencies being valued in U.S. dollars and, and, and so forth. And so there's a lot of that kind of stuff, and Oliver was you know all these kinds of things worried him and. And so he wrote a little book called A New Constitution for a New Country in 1968, in which he essentially wrote a constitution uh, and wrote a preface to it about, you know, the sort of coming collapse and, you know, moochers and social parasites. And, you know, he had the whole language of, uh, of sort of anti-welfare state, anti-New Deal uh, language of the era. And um, so he had three projects that I explore in pretty close detail and which are part of the reason why I try to be very attentive to the questions of colonialism and decolonization, because he himself said there are lots of places that are decolonizing and the mother country is going to be too busy doing other things to be concerned. And we should try to right? these are the places where we should try to set up a new country is places that are decolonizing. So he, you know, he or his associates traveled to you know, Suriname, Curacao, Trinidad and Tobago, Honduras, uh, the Southwest Pacific. Um, looking for these various opportunities and places. And so they struck on three places. The first one, 1971 and 1972, they tried to 
he and his backers, he had some very financially wealthy backers, some, some of them being people whose names would probably be recognized by some of your listeners. Um, and they, uh, they hit upon a reef in the Southwest Pacific, the Minerva Reefs, which are in between you know, the north of New Zealand and south of Fiji and Tonga. The reefs are underwater most of the time out of the day, um, but they uh, hired a dredging vessel to dredge sand out of the reef, uh, out of the lagoon and pile it on top of the reef. And then the idea was that they would take coral and encapsulate it in chicken wire, fill it with concrete and build a platform that would eventually house up to 30,000 people. Um, and you would be a settler, right? You could, you could invest in one of two ways. You could invest as a settler, which means you would invest and actually have rights to property. Uh, or you could invest as a kind of speculator, as a, as someone who's not going to settle there, but support the project as a kind of uh, investor, as a as a speculative investment. Um, it's not unlike actually what's happening in Vanuatu now with Satoshi Island, which I can talk about at another point. Um, so that was the first project that didn't go well because um, the king of Tonga, but also the uh, administration of Fiji at the time and elsewhere, all of these Pacific Island countries were quite nervous about something like this because there's a lot of seamounts and a lot of reefs and a lot of atolls that could have created, if this went forward, it could have created a kind of ocean rush or reef rush. Um, and so they opposed it quite significantly. And in fact, the King of Tonga occupied the Minerva Reef uh, at one point. Um, and there was unity amongst the South Pacific archipelago, Southwest Pacific archipelagos to, to oppose this. Um, then you had, um, by the way, I'll mention also the UN Commission on the Laws of the Seas, right? The UNCLOS, which was eventually signed and passed in 1982, addressed a lot of these archipelagic issues. And those are things that the seasteaders today still have to kind of, uh, deal with. The second project he had was in the Bahamas. Um, again, it wasn't just Oliver, it was an array of people, but this was, a a project in which the Bahamas was slated for independence in 1973, and it was going to be a predominantly black government. Um, and the northern islands in the Bahamas, the Abaco Islands, uh, wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, didn't want to remain a part of the Bahamas. Um, and, uh, and, a, and a portion of this resistance was clearly based upon the fact that there would be a uh, predominantly black government. Uh, so it was racist, uh, the opposition. Um, but not not entirely. There were other aspects of the opposition as well. It wasn't solely uh, that, but that was a threat. Um, and here the idea was, again, uh, to help foment uh, this secessionist rebellion and uh, to set up, again, create a kind of private country um, uh, that would be run along the lines that were laid out in, in his 1968 new constitution for a new country. And here he was uh, working with you know, some fairly sketchy individuals, uh, a man by the name of Mitchell Livingston Wormel III, who created uh, sound suppressors, silencers for some of the deadliest weaponry that had been created up to that point, the Ingram Mac 10. I go into some detail about this because it's fascinating to me the, the ways in which these, you know, hyper-capitalist uh, libertarian projects can very quickly bleed into a pretty shady world of underground kind of stuff uh, shady real estate speculation, shady uh, anti-communist politics, um, uh, and uh, and weaponry and arms munitions and things like this. Um, that project didn't go well either. It, it sort of fell apart because the FBI was tracking some of these individuals, including Michael Oliver himself, and um, and it, and just it, it sort of folded in a lot of the people that were initially supportive of this in Abaco decided that they didn't want a kind of violent insurrection or the risk of a violent insurrection. And then there was a last project uh, that I write about in some detail. This took place in, in the New Hebrides, which is now called Vanuatu. It's an archipelago in the Southwest Pacific. Um, and it had been colonized by the French and the English together, the French and the British together. Um, it was called a condominium government. The locals called it pandemonium, but the but the French and the British called it a condominium. And, uh, but that was, this was clearly a case in which this was an archipelago that was moving towards independence in the 1970s. The British wanted out, the French were kind of not sure what they wanted to do. They were trying to stall a little bit. Um, and you had a, a, a movement, an anti-colonial movement that developed there uh, that Michael Oliver backed. Um, but it was also an anti-colonial movement that was in struggle with another anti-colonial movement on, on the islands, 
And so one of the movements Oliver and his and his supporters, including John Hospers, who was a philosophy professor at the University of Southern California and the first candidate for for president of the United States on the libertarian ticket in the 1970s. Uh, Hospers, there's a there's a, a array of really in, interesting individuals involved in a lot of his projects. But uh, Hospers and Oliver and another man, uh, F. Thomas Eck III, um, the third, the three of them were uh, involved in you know, providing radio parts and transmitters and things like this to the to the movement um, in uh, the New Hebrides, and there ended up with there ended up as a, a rebellion in 1980. So independence was supposed to happen in 1980. Uh, but on the cusp of independence, there were there was a rebellion that in part was fomented by the Phoenix Foundation, which is this organization that Oliver and others had, had put together. Uh, just very quickly, I'll mention a few of the people that were involved in that project. The, the Fair, uh, Ralph Fair, very um, prominent uh, Texan libertarian. Um, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Achiever, I can't remember his exact name, but he's written a lot of sort of libertarian, uh, um, sort of end of times evangelical stuff. Uh, the Lapont couple, who were prominent Alaska libertarians. I mean, there were some big. Um, I, I don't want to say big names, but there were some recognizable sort of libertarian politicos. Uh, yeah, exactly. In, involved in these things, and um, and that was the last one. I mean, there was a uh, there was an out. You know. An actual uprising and uh, ended with death and displacement, and, and at that point Oliver kind of you know stopped. He, he cost him a lot of his money. He was frustrated. He given more than a decade of his life to these projects, but it was also the case that by the 1980s, um, you know, you've got the Reagan and Thatcher uh, revolutions underway. And so one of the things I note is that it's much easier at that point to kind of socially secede than to territorially secede, and you don't really need to territorially secede in some ways with the kind of changes that are taking place under Reagan and Thatcher. So anyways, uh, that's a kind of quick summary of, of the worlds of, uh, of, of Michael Oliver and his backers and their projects. Yes. So I'm curious about the, um, the fact that, you know, we've been just discussing this history of, you know, libertarian exit projects. And I was curious whether, you know, this remark you make in the book, um, that, you know, libertarian exit projects like charter cities have a poor grasp of history and politics. Yet, when we look at a book like The Network State, it has pretensions, at least, towards providing an objective and actionable version of history, as uh, the author calls it. And so I'm curious, um, you know, how do you view the way that libertarians use or uh, apply history um, to the extent that they do at all? And secondly, um, what are the issues with, you know, trying to treat history like a sort of ironclad, infallible d database that you can sort of skim through for facts? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it's, um, as a historian, it is frustrating to kind of read the ways that uh, non-historians uh, will sometimes articulate what history means um, in the, the network state. You know, I, I sort of stopped at a certain point from from highlighting to myself all the sort of um, tedious platitudes that you see uh, trotted out over and over about history. You know, learning from the past and and uh, you know not repeating the past. And, um, you know, there, there's this this kind of um, uh, I don't want to call it pop understanding, but but a kind of flatness uh, and uh, an unwillingness to think about. Um, history as a kind of interpretative act between sort of what, you know, what happened in the past, but also what was said to have happened in the past to take from, from a wonderful um, scholar, Haitian anthropologist, Michel Rolf Truyot, you know, and that it's always this kind of dialogue. Um, and so, and I don't think we should be uh, shy about admitting that there's a dialogue between always between our own moment and, um, and the past and how it's been narrated and who's narrating it and, and what is said to have happened and what happened. And that, you know, so this kind of relationship between sort of objectivity, subjectivity and neutrality is, is a kind of relationship that, that you, you have to uh, 
take on and enter and think about in writing about the past. It's not some kind of ironclad thing. There aren't laws of history. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a fairly strong advocate of, uh, of a lot of Marx's writings about history. Um, and, uh, but even then, of course, you know, there's not a kind of ironclad law that can just be sort of economically reduced uh, to, you know, can't just all just be class struggle all the time, right? I mean, even within that, there's a kind of nuance uh, that one uh, brings out. And so it is frustrating. I mean, I think I mentioned at the beginning the, the kind of way in which the Seasteaders had talked about history in their book. I mean, it, you know, and, and I, uh, and, and a particularly um, mean-spirited moment, I compared them to, I told, you know, I said they should read more Cormac McCarthy when they talk about the U.S. West and less Lynn Cheney. Um, because, uh, you know, they have this kind of patriotic primer vision, uh, you know, sort of first grade or second grade vision of sort of patriotic American westward expansion that just is uh, extraordinarily offensive and problematic in terms of what it ignores and doesn't pay attention to and just allies that, the kind of violence, not just violence against Native peoples, which is absolutely dramatic, but also violence against uh, Mexicans in the Southwest and, and in California and Chileans and during the gold rush and, um, uh, you know, and African-Americans who are being moved West and, and themselves searching for freedom. And, you know, we can, we can uh, talk at great length about this. And so, yeah, the vision of history is, is problematic. I mean, whenever there's a kind of bullet point, sketch of, of history and a kind of reduction of it to the, the a process of bullet points, um, I get, uh, I get very nervous, uh, about <laughs> yeah. that. And so, um, yeah. 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 I, I thought it was interesting that he meant like, I think it was cause he said, I think the title of one of his like sections is if the news is fake, imagine history. Yeah. Right. Which I mean, there's there's like that, so many like yeah. uh, just so many so many parts of my brain hurt when you know when I read some of the sections that it's uh, a yeah. pretty frustrating. Yeah. Primavera wants to say yeah. something. I just wanted to uh, perhaps also add one additional layer in which we can uh, conceptualize and theorize colonization. Uh, which is like the the extent like colonization not just in terms of space and territory, but colonization in terms of uh, mimetic land grabbing and, uh, and historical reconstruction. Yeah. Um, is, is, do you have like a particular uh, interest in this or vision on that? And like, is, is, is the book that Balash is doing actually intentionally uh, or non-intentionally, but somehow it does have the effect of uh, rewriting history and isn't that also some some new form of uh, colonization? How does he colonize us with brain worms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the, I mean, the, the struggle around history is, I mean, in some points, right, about uh, this kind of idea that one can colonize the past in, in certain kinds of ways. And yeah, so I think being able, you know, this is why when I when we were talking earlier, I mentioned that, um, the ways in which for uh, a lot of um, writing in this kind of libertarian vein in the 60s and the 70s in particular, the starting point is always, and it sounds like a kind of natural thing to do, the starting point is the sort of individual sovereign subject, right? The sort of individual human being, and then they create collectives and all these kinds of things and so forth. And, and yet that itself is a kind of colonization of the past. I mean, it's a sort of Robinson Crusoe version uh, of history that starts with a certain kind of idea of an individual and starts from the individual and works out. And that's, you know, that, that's, that's not necessarily natural at all. That's, that itself is a sort of social construction. It's a choice about how to write history and where the starting point of the writing of history uh, is. And so if this, something like the network state, to, you know, to my mind is very much, um, a kind of, um, I don't know, you know, sort of AP class, uh, political theory, right? I mean, it sort of lays out in, in very kind of mechanistic ways, uh, the definitions of the state, the definitions of nation, um, you know, the use of mapping, the use of print capitalism, 
Um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's very static, uh, very mechanistic, uh, and with no sense of how sort of collectives themselves, right, sort of come into being through sort of rewriting uh, history, rethinking history in certain kinds of ways. Um, and so, it, you know, it's a, it's a way of thinking about history that works to, to his um, advantage in terms of what he wants to um, construct. And there is a, in the end, I mean, I think at some level, there's a kind of erasure of, of, of history um, in the sense of erasing it, um, going back to this blank, blank slate idea, right? in, in the sense of erasing the ways in which it has to be uh, at some level interpretative and contested um, and understood as uh, um, as something that you struggle through and struggle over. And, and a lot of conclusions that you reach are much better than other conclusions that you reach, right? And that's based upon a kind of body of evidence, but also a kind of way in which you persuasively interpret uh, that evidence. And you don't get that here, right? What you get is this very sort of mechanistic idea about um, about the past and one that, that suits right, the kinds of things that he wants to... Uh, just It just happens to be just very convenient. It just so happens that history worked okay. out uh, in the way that uh, good for my goals or whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, the thing, you know, the thing that always strikes me is, you know, it, it made me think about uh, Murray Rothbard, um, Robert Nozick. Um, so Nozick was a philosopher who in 1974 wrote a book called Anarchy, State and Utopia, which was a kind of response to John Rawls's theory of justice uh, about society and, and freedom and equality. And Nozick's book was probably probably to this day is the most um, sophisticated philosophical defense of sort of ultra minimalist statism, libertarianism. Um, but both in their, both in Nozick's book, but also in, um, in Murray Rothbard's writing and others, they do the same thing over and over again. They, they say, you know, they go back to, you know, thinking about Locke's uh, theory of labor and and property rights and so you know Locke's idea being you invest your own what you have control over what you have rights over what you have property over is your own self and your own labor as an individual again starting with that premise of the individual and that if you mix your labor with something then it then it becomes your your property and Rothbard talks about um you know let's take for example like clay or something he's talking about sort of uh, I can't remember what it was he's talking about some kind of object um that you make. And there was another version of this about the pencil, Leonard Reed, I think, uh, did this. But it was all about this kind of um, object. But the uh, the thing, yeah, the pencil, right, is the earlier one. That's, yeah. Thank you, uh, Morshed, for saying that. Um, but Ma Rothbard says things like, let's bracket for a moment, you know, where the, where the primary objects come from, right, that you use to fashion into something. Um, but he never gets back to it. Um, and of course, he doesn't get back to it. And of course, the other uh, writers in this vein don't get back to it. Because if you do go to the primary place where these, you know, first, the primary resources you need, first and foremost, come from, you have to deal with the question of expropriation. Um, you have to deal with the, with the question of takings. Uh, and and Nozick tries to deal with this a little bit by talking about the possibility of reparations, unjust takings. Um, but but that's, you know, this is a certain kind of way uh, in the writing of history that I think, you know, this, it's what it reminds me of. It's the constant elision uh, of these questions of uh, violence, of primitive accumulation, of dispossession, of the basic foundation of the sort of social world that things come from. Uh, and, if, and if they come from a social world, then they have repercussions beyond the single individual who's making the pencil right. Right, or making whatever. So if you rewrite history with a couple of simplistic memes riddled throughout it, then you can sort of colonize people's minds and eventually that will lead you to the ability to colonize land <laughs> and create your own, uh, <laughs> your new country. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you, I, I will say, uh, along with the network state, I mean, I've mentioned this book a couple of times and so your listeners, I mean, the, the, the section on history in, in, um, 
in the book seasteading by Burke and Friedman is just uh um very good you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. but it's a very good example to read of just how um re- really negligent they were in in sort of taking history uh seriously i mean it's filled with all kinds of picture book falsehoods about you know uh new utopians going to the new world and uh you know and and, and all this kind of stuff that just completely um, ignores and downplays and invisibilizes the incredible violence um, and and uh, yeah. and forms of expropriation that took place. But I think it's really important because we're talking about capital that uh, that is forgotten. But I think culture is perhaps the most powerful tool that we also have today uh, to to manipulate and or to contaminate the minds of people. So I guess we're moving from colonization to contamination. <laughs> uh, but eventually, I think this is like, we cannot ignore the, the force of information and culture. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think the network state is a very good example of like, it has, it has managed to colonize our minds even before it started to colonize. I mean, perhaps this is also just uh, another form of, uh, not to bring in another <laughs> concept, but uh, culture hegem- uh, cultural hegemony from, uh, you know, from Gramsci, mm-hmm. um, kind of wanting to trick people or I say trick, but like, not just that you can't, that uh, powerful forces can't just like dominate you physically, but they have to dominate you in the way that you think and the way that you value things and etc cetera, etc cetera. you have to that has to it has to convince you that capitalism is also good it can't just force you into uh into it yeah no that's right i mean right this kind of combination of coercion uh and and consent and um and so you know i mean the interesting thing always is i think is that um it would be interesting to see what uh a range of how a range of readers would respond to the network state. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that many readers coming from backgrounds with, even if they were very tech savvy and, and even, um, even inclined to kind of like certain aspects of it, if they came from backgrounds, um, that weren't, you know, uh, modestly privileged at the least would have a much more critical read of it. I mean, there's a, you know, Jim Scott, James Scott, the guy, you know, seeing like a state and, and um, against the grain and part of not being I governed. think he even, he even mentioned seeing like a state in, in yeah. the book, which yeah. drove me nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, his, his point about Gramsci is that, you know, Gramsci had it sort of wrong, right? I mean, he's sitting in prison in the 1920s and he's trying to figure out why Italy isn't having a revolution like the Russian revolution when it has the same sort of structural conditions. You know, and so his position was, well, people are constrained at the level of, of imagination, um, you know, uh, and that you need to kind of, you know, change that imagination. And, and Scott's, you know, Scott's argument is the reverse, right? That people aren't constrained at the level of imagination at all. They're constrained at the level of material means um, and the recognition, right, that who's got the monopoly of violence and that, that it's going to be very risky for them to, to rise up. But they know exactly how exploited they are. They know exactly what the hell is happening to them. They know they can't stand the manager. They know they can't stand the field boss. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to think about something like the network state and who the reader might be and rec- right, and recognizing just what the implications of something like the network state are for most people. Right. I think I quote in the book at the very end of my book, I quote the, you know, because a lot of a lot of what this makes me think about is white flight. And, um, you know, the, the sort of exit as a privilege. And, uh, and you know, there's that great, um, uh, there's that great poem, uh, right, from um, uh, uh, Gil Heron, um, where he says, you know, Whitey on the moon, right? Uh, my, my sister Nell has been bit by a rat, but, you know, in the meantime, Whitey's on the moon, right? And it's, so it's like, it's all this public money and private money going to, putting some white dude on the moon while, uh, you know, someone, someone has a, a, a sister, a family member who can't even get healthcare. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, any last questions from Morshed or Primavera before we close it out? No, I think, uh, covered uh, a lot today in the, in the over an hour. And I'm just really grateful to, to hear the, 
insights from uh, Raymond about uh, his wonderful uh, book that actually only came out less than a year ago. So Yeah, it came out in uh, July of 2022. Yeah. Nice. And I guess we'll close out here. Thanks so much, uh, Raymond, for coming on and talking to yeah. us. Uh, the book is called Adventure Capitalism, A History of Libertarian Exit from the Era of Decolonization to the Digital Age. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.